Private Lender Podcast, Episode 74. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Paul Samuelson, who said, Investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Hey, 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 Lender Nation. Welcome to episode 74 of the Private Lender Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Baker, and I'd like to thank you for lending me your ear today. Oh, it's a bad joke. But anyway, welcome. If you're looking for practical tips and advice on mitigating and eliminating risk with the investment vehicle known as private mortgage lending, then you're in the right place. But if you want to learn from my mistakes so that you can avoid them, then pull up a chair, my friend. This podcast is created for those who are looking to take control of their financial future by doing what it takes to create wealth in a marathon of life with old world techniques and values. I'm looking to create a tribe of lenders that will disrupt the way we think about and teach our kids about money. And speaking of money, today's episode will be geared towards more towards the borrowers out there. A few lenders as well, but I would imagine those who would want to borrow from a private lender would find an interest in today's guest. Because as I have the pleasure of speaking to Nick Rathel, who has a very impressive business model that holds your hands and walks you into becoming your own author, your own book in a very short amount of time. And it's really a cool idea from a very interesting individual. I want to introduce him to Lender Nation. But before we get into the interview with Nick and learn how he he does his magic, I have some news to share. And there's going to be a big piece of humble pie coming my way because not too long ago I said I was going to give up sponsors, yada, 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 and focus on you know, other things and content and whatnot, and which I have done. But at the same time, this opportunity has come to take on a sponsor, which is Quest Trust Company, and they can't pay me. It's really a symbiotic relationship where I'm able to teach classes with them. I sponsor their events, and they in turn are sponsoring podcasts leading up into their expo. They're having their big self-directed IRA expo, the second one ever this August. And stick around for promo code. Actually, it's PL Podcast for a 25% discount. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble on. They've made a little clip and I'd like to play the mid-roll for you. So I'm bringing back sponsorships for the Quest IRA Expo this August 23rd. I'll be there. Also be hosting a happy hour the night before it starts at the hotel bar. So I say when I say hosting, I don't know how many cocktails I'm going to buy, but at least we'll be there and we're going to have a pretty cool event organized uh, with a lot of the vendors and VIPs that will be showing up at the conference. So Without further ado, let's get to the mid-roll for Quest Trust Company's IRA Expo. The Quest Expo is Quest Trust Company's annual trade show, and it's coming right to Houston, Texas on August 23rd to the 25th of this year. Wow, what happens at the Quest Expo? It's a weekend jam-packed with education on all different types of real estate or note-related topics from industry experts across the U.S., Plus, there's always tons of fun networking opportunities like a casino party, tickets to the Houston Astros game, and so much more. Visit questexpo.com to get your ticket today for August 23rd to the 25th. See you there. And if you go to the show notes page or just go to privatelenderpodcast.com, you can find links to to get tickets and just put that promo code PL podcast in there and get 25% off. So, Let's get down to the business now that the bills have been paid. Let's go ahead and bring on Nick Ruthell. Baba Bowie. Linda Nation, you're in for a treat today because I have Nick Ruthell on with us today. And Nick has a very interesting business model that can help perhaps lenders and investors alike. And he has a very interesting story. And I can't wait to get into it. So let's go ahead and welcome Nick Ruthell. Nick, welcome to the Private Lender Podcast. Keith, thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to contributing. All right. So just uh, for the listeners, give us an idea. I understand you're, you're relatively new in your actual deal making with the real estate game. And, and we're going to talk about the real reason why I wanted you on. But go ahead and give us a little background, origin, how you got into uh, real estate and how you got into having your podcast and this business of creating books for investors. 
Sure. So my background is, as you were saying, is the creator of a system that helps real estate investors and private lenders, people really throughout the entire space and related spaces to create their own professionally published book for building their authority, building their investor database, and really promoting themselves and their businesses in the span of just seven hours. And what led to that was an interest in content creation, so the use of content and content marketing, and then that transition into books, realizing that of all the forms of content that a person could use to build their credibility, one of the most tangible and most affording for that to having worked then with a variety of clients, helping them to get a book and use that book, build their authority. I myself began to kind of fall in love, so to speak, with real estate. I was hearing about it from our clients who were investors. They were doing syndications. They were doing flips. could actually be feasible for anyone, really, not just people who've been doing it, say, a doctor or an attorney beginning to think about their retirement, but the average person. That is it. Unfortunately, I'm having some difficulty hearing you. So we'll have to see if the, when we go to the tape, if this comes out, but, and we'll get back into the real estate side of it, but what is like, how do I create a book in seven hours or how do you help me create a book in seven hours? Well, that's the key part that you yourself are not creating a book in seven hours. All of the people we work with our clients they only have to spend a total of seven hours of their time on the process. We on our side are spending a whole lot more than just seven hours to (laughs) actually create the book. What they're doing though, is they're talking to us on seven one hour calls over Zoom or Skype or phone even. And in that process with the calls, they're going through a set of questions and a framework to get the ideas for the book out of their head and give those ideas to us as we're doing the calls and as we're questioning them to then on our side, create the book. So that's kind of the gist of the seven hour book. Wow. So, so seven hours for the quote unquote author or your client, how many hours are you guys running behind the scenes to, uh, I mean, you guys have some prolific writers on staff or are you doing this yourself or do you have uh, people to help you with this? No, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a very talented team that has taken quite a while to assemble. But uh, in terms of how long we as a team are spending on it, it's too long, I think. <laughs> That'd be a, a short way of answering that, too long. Too long in a good way, though. You know, Some of our writers tend to be a little bit more obsessive in terms of how much time they spend on a particular chapter or on a particular section of the book. I want to have, I suppose, from a quality perspective, but too long. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, you, you want good quality, but from an operations perspective, that can bog you down. So, okay, well, if you don't mind, kind of let's walk me through high level overview of these seven calls. What are you helping me with? Then let's say I'm a real estate investor and I want to be a flipper, for example. Well, let's say you're a flipper. The very first step in that process of even doing a book is to determine should you have one in the first place? And the reason I say that is because sometimes you might find that your goals don't necessarily need a book in order to be accomplished. If your goal is simply to flip more houses or to attract more deals to you, well, there are a variety of ways that you could do that. You might, for example, just need to send out more mail, just hook up with a direct mail powerhouse company and just send more mail pieces. Or maybe you need to go on the attack with bandit signs. Just put out more bandit signs. Maybe those are actually the means by which you're going to achieve your goals. Now, you could find, though, that your goals are achieved through a book. And that's where someone like myself would come in with the seven-hour book. But I would encourage everyone listening to think for a moment before the book enters the picture about what their goals are and what are all of the ways to achieve those goals. That is, that's a great first step. I'm kind of taken aback. I really like that. I mean, it's extremely pragmatic and practical, but yeah, looking at other options to say, okay, is a book a fit? Is it going to be a a fit for me? Interesting. And he said, and it's geared to build credibility. So 
if I just wanted to flip, I see where, yeah, just amp up the marketing. However, if I want to start teaching how to flip, then I could see if I wanted to ramp up a coaching business, I could see where that would, or even uh, like you said, you work with people who are doing syndications. I could see where a book would be a great way to basically open doors for somebody. Yeah, a book really, and especially in the syndication sense, does open doors because you are looking, and we've seen this with clients we're working with who are syndicators, you're looking to build the number of email subscribers or build the number of contacts in your database. And one of the best ways to have people coming into your database is to give them something of value and trust you and stay in contact with you. And if you're giving them a book, not only does it show them that you know what you're doing, which is very, very important in the area of syndications. I mean, you don't want to go into a syndication with someone who they're not really sure, does he even know how to refi these properties with a five-year turnaround? So you want to make sure you're educating on that, them on that. But you also want a logical way to stay in touch with them, a way that isn't just continually pitching them, but is actually giving them something of value. And that's what a book would do. Oh, man. All right. So I myself have entered the fray of online e-commerce content marketing. And that was, you know, he said, a great way to stay in touch with them without pitching. And that's anyone who's on my email list knows that I email extremely infrequently like hardly ever. And every guru out there, I know I'm doing it wrong, but I'm, I want to build brand more than I want to pitch somebody. I'm thinking you might have, you're doing a hell of a sales pitch here in this interview. Uh, <laughs> I'm sitting there looking like, man, this, I could totally use this myself, but I want to get it back into the listeners, but yeah, I'm still hung up on, that's a great way without pitching. And I got on Grant Cardone's list and I got tired of 10 emails a day. You know, I had to get off of it. So this is a great way that it's portable. This is funny. The more I talk to you, the more I love this idea. Kind of walk us through a typical, like, let's go with syndications now. Let's get out of single family. Let's go in apartment buildings or commercial. We're getting 10 or 12 investors together. And a sponsor comes to you and says, Nick, can you put a book together for me? You guys sit down and establish that, okay, the goals are in alignment. You know, a book will help him. Is there like a lot of paperwork or is it all just chatting on the phone to get the information to your company? Yeah, in, in terms of the paperwork itself, what you were saying, we really try to keep that to a minimum and really just focus it on talking over the phone. Because if you're a real estate investor, especially as we're saying syndicators, you know, flippers can be quite busy too. If you're in that position, you already have enough stuff to worry about. So we're trying to take as much of the paperwork and as much of the headache out of it through just simplifying it to just talking with us on the phone. Now, in doing many of these calls, we will often send questions and outlines for the calls to people ahead of time, but we don't expect them necessarily to spend hours on their end preparing. Yeah, I hate the word hack, but I can't think of one. To me, a hack has a negative connotation, an easy short step or a shortcut, but you've taken the heavy lifting out of the quote unquote author's hands. And do you consider yourself uh, ghost authors or co authors, or how does that work? No, no, we're definitely not ghost writers or ghost authors or anything of that sort. And the reason for that is that ghost writers typically are just English majors or people who are focused on making something sound pretty. And while there's nothing wrong with words that sound clever or smart, that's not our goal. Our goal is specifically ROI in getting a result. And if that result can be achieved through writing something that makes people laugh or chuckle, okay. But we're not looking at it from that perspective. We're looking at it from the perspective of how do we craft this book and put it together in such a way that it's going to get that result. And we're also looking beyond just the book coming out to what we can do to market this and how we can make this book go viral within your target demographic. So it does start bringing in a flood of interested investors or a flood of other people to help you achieve your goal. So not only do you put the book together, but you help market it? Absolutely. And part of marketing that uh, we focus on too is building it into the book itself. And that's something that a lot of ghost writers, if you will, and other people who focus on writing miss. The idea that when you're creating a book, 
you've been building in, for example, book ambassadors. And what I mean by a book ambassador is someone who has a vested interest in promoting the book. How would you do that? Well, one of the ways you would would be to take past people you've worked with, if you're a deal sponsor, people you've worked with in the past, put them, write them into the book, whether that's a direct story of how they've been involved with you, or if they've done real estate investments of their own, feature their stories from those investments in the book too. So by doing that, you're giving them a reason to praise the book and to promote the book once it comes out because they're in it. I mean, who wouldn't want to promote a book that they're in? So that, that you're creating book ambassadors through actually writing. I'm going to completely go squirrel moment, shiny object here. How did you come up with this idea? Not the secret sauce, but what was happening when, when this idea hit you? For ideas, are you talking about the book ambassador? Or? No, for the, I'm sorry, for the, for the whole business. I understand the book ambassador. You're, you're basically laying the groundwork for someone to speak well of the book, but just the whole process of the, seven, the whole idea of the seven-hour book. How did that come about? Well, it was really a fusion of a couple of different things. One of them being that people who want to do books, the issue always, or nearly almost always, seems to be that they just don't have time. And you can't blame them, really. If they're doing syndications, if they're flipping houses, if they're doing wholesale deals, there really just is not any time left over. And yet people know at the same time, too, that a book can be tremendously powerful in attracting speaking opportunities or in building your authority or in accomplishing various other goals. So recognizing time was the issue and trying to figure out how to mitigate and ultimately eliminate that issue standing between them. I'm on this same side with you on that. I find it fascinating to think about hacking and life hacking and just trying to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday through various productivity kicks. All of those together, the result was the seven-hour book. That's great. Hey, you've identified a problem and you solve it. That makes it sound like an ultra simple thing, but that's, that's what good businesses do. I mean, especially now, you know, the Alexa world that we live in, the, like the drive through Alexa world. Yeah, time is our most precious commodity. And you find a way that to give, you're basically giving an author time. That's what you're doing. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. So how long have you been going at this? I would say long enough to get gray hairs, putting it, uh, <laughs> putting it like that. We've been doing it for uh, quite some time. It just ends up actually getting pretty stressful thinking about all the books. Wow. Okay. And your clientele, like syndications, sort of, do you get a lot of single family people coming for your services or is it a more sophisticated investor or both? How's that kind of mix? It is both, although we have seen recently, and this is probably due to the surging popularity right now of multifamily, that there are recently at least a lot more multifamily guys. We're sort of in the midst of kind of the, what I would term the multifamily gold rush in the sense that it's just everyone wants to be in it right now. And I think that uh, with so many people wanting to be in it, that's creating a need for people to try to position themselves and stand out. And we're seeing them do that, whether it's through books on my side or even starting podcasts. I can vouch from personal experience that you're, I've put a lot more than seven hours into this podcast. So. You're the the giver and taker of time. I love that, man. That's great. And, and, and yeah, it's there is the you call it the multifamily gold rush right now. That's a, a very apt way of of saying it, I think, especially more so in the Dallas Fort Worth area in my home state, but it's definitely going on. And I mean, I remember sitting in a mastermind years ago and the guy said, What's the difference between investing in a hundred thousand dollar house or a one million dollar property, commercial or property? And the answer was a comma and some zeros. That's, you know, <laughs> that's it. So I, I'm not surprised that there's been a natural progression for more and more people into multifamily. And like you said, yeah, it's, it's quite popular, quite popular right now. So I, um, I know you said that you weren't, you've learned from the, your clients on real estate and doing deals. And, you know, I'm glad and thank you for your candor for saying you're, you know, you're just kind of starting out, but I would love to know what type of deals you, you like to do. Are you a wholesaler, are you a landlord, flipper? What do you like about real estate? What are you uh, trying to do? Well, I found that given everything we're involved in with the seven hour book, managing the team, all of that, 
flipping and wholesaling is making the most sense right now, just from the standpoint that it really doesn't require that much time. A lot of it, I'm nowhere near as uh, proficient at it as many of the people out there, but a lot of it can be automated and it can be automated, it can be outsourced. So that really makes it a lot easier with sending out the mail, with finding people on various delinquent tax lists. So that's sort of where I am right now with real estate using those channels. And eventually, perhaps, but long before that, I would be much more interested in going into self-storage uh, or even something which I really don't know too much about, but I would love to talk to someone on. Okay. Fortunately, that last part, I don't know. I couldn't make it out, but you were talking about like the pods, the storage, they drop them off at the people's house? Yes. Yeah, self-storage. So self-storage units in self-storage complexes. I think that's fascinating. And I would also, at some point in the future, be interested in exploring container shipping. So essentially self-storage units that you perch on the side of a dock or that you even put on a, a boat. Because I think there's undoubtedly an opportunity there. I just realized, what part of the country are you in for the listeners? Let give them some perspective. Based out west, so west coast. West coast. Okay. Excellent. And yeah, well, the West Coast has a lot of docks, ports and terminals and whatnot. In my day job as an insurance in the oil field, I, I deal with a lot of that, that stuff. So we can talk further about that offline. So I'd like to know what book are you reading right now? That is a really good question. One of these people who tends to look at books almost like a buffet in that I'll pile a bunch of them on my plate, so to speak, at once and kind of work through them from that standpoint. So right now on my plate, if you will, coming back from the buffet, there's a couple of books right now. One of them that I'm rereading at this point is The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, which is coming at it from the personal development standpoint. I really, really like that book because as the title suggests, it is about thinking big. It's about expanding your thinking and also with that book, overcoming cliches and mental limiting beliefs that tend to set in over time. One of them being that I'm too old to do X. So that's one of the books that I'm reading through right now. Uh, another one would be giving it a, a shot, Set for Life, Scott Trench, Rockets. Heard very good things. It was actually recommended just last week by a guest on my podcast, had Jay Papasan on. He recommended it. So I'm giving that book a spin. And those are two of the ones that come to mind right now. Thank you for sharing those with us. What is something that most people don't know about Nick Rathel? Probably the fact that I love running ultras. And I'm actually in the process of training right now for my first ultra. I've done a couple of marathons to date, and I really, really want to get into the ultra space. I've seen amazing things about it. Okay. One, help me out here. Ultra marathon. How many miles is that? That's the thing. It varies. If it's anything upwards of, I believe it's about 30 miles, anything upwards of about 30 miles. Okay. And I'm curious, what intrigues you about that? Well, I've always been into distance running and ultras just seem kind of like the final frontier, so to speak. You know, we talk about outer space being the final frontier, but from an endurance and particular running standpoint, ultras seem like the uh, overland. This is funny. My wife's a runner and she ran a, the Houston Marathon and unfortunately, five months later, broke her foot. And yeah, so it, it set her back, obviously. And she's run the last two halves and she derives as much enjoyment or pleasure or satisfaction from running long distances as I do, say, cooking barbecue or doing some French cooking in the kitchen. You know, it's almost as if classical music is playing in the background for me when I'm cooking and she kind of explained or described it similar to her. So, and it was funny because her, her podiatrist, when she broke her foot, he's big into the Ironman and his son, 13 year old kid is goes with him and races with him. And I just look at that and go, I have absolutely no excuse <laughs> for my current physique, but thank you for that. Cause that is uh, the whole running thing is um, like I said, my wife loves it. I just don't get it, but I totally appreciate that you love it. So if you ever want to get into it or get steps going in that direction, I could certainly help you because it's running is kind of, I found is kind of an acquired taste 
in that you don't really have to be a born runner. There really aren't too many born runners, unless we're talking about the Kenyans or that tribe in Mexico that they wrote a book about. Mm -hmm. But other than other than those groups, a lot of people who enjoy it and happen to be pretty good at it didn't start out that way. Whether through some life event like being obese or just finding through other circumstances that they were running and that they enjoyed it, that was how they got into it. And those of us who are doing these upper distances in running, whether it's your wife or in my case, trying to do even longer races, we're not necessarily superhumans or out of the ordinary. It's the sort of thing that you have a plan and you know what you want. It's well within your reach. That's great, man. You're not very competitive, are you? I, mean, I know you are with yourself, but outside with other people, you, comp- you consider yourself competitive? Well, that's one of the beauties I found of running in that it's one of those activities that reminds you beyond just the sport itself, but it reminds you that each of us really is moving at their own pace and moving at their own rate, really, through life, living our own story. And what I mean by that is it might sound a little bit esoteric, but if you think about being out on the trail running, you're running along and then suddenly someone else, you see them coming, you don't know where they've been, you don't know how much longer their run is going to be. So if they come along and they pass you, do you speed up and you try to race them? Or do you recognize that, like I said, you don't know where they've been, you don't know how much longer their run is going to be? If somebody wanted to get in touch with you about running or let's say they they need a book, how do they get in touch with you, Nick? Sure. The best way would be to go to our website, contentcore.net. That's C-O-N-T-E-N-T. C O R P S dot N E T content net and look on the website. Think again about whether a book really is something that makes sense for their goals. And if it does, then fill out the content form. That's, and we'll have the, all the, the links and everything will be on the show notes page over at podcast page. So, Nick, well, first off, I want to thank you for reaching out to me because this is all happening because of an email that you sent me. And so you took that first step and I I greatly appreciate it. I've really enjoyed your interview here today. And I would really like to to touch base with you in a little while and see how your real estate investing is coming along and definitely going to talk to you offline about running barbecue and a few other things. Thank you, Keith, for having me. Take care. Baba Bowie. And there you have it, ladies and gents. I want to thank Nick for coming on the show today, talking about his seven steps, seven hours. And you can listen to, I was interviewed by Nick. So that episode's live. You can go to the show notes page and get the link for that as well. One of my favorite interviews I've done on someone else's show. So really interesting. I highly recommend you guys go there, check it out. And of course, it's time for me to grovel and ask that if you find value in this show, please leave me a rating and review over at iTunes. Connect with me on social media, Twitter, Twitter. Why did I say that? Facebook, Instagram, mostly. LinkedIn, uh, and sometimes bigger pockets. Again, all those links can be found at the show notes page, privatelenderpodcast.com. I want to thank you for listening today. I appreciate your time, your consideration, and I'm going to ask that you keep reaching out to me. I really appreciate the feedback and the emails. I know I owe a lot of people a lot of apologies because I've found some emails that are three, four months old. I'm trying to get responded to those, but that's my fault letting them slip through the cracks. So I uh, apologize, but thank you for reaching out. Please continue to do so. And besides good health and fulfillment, I wish you all safe and prosperous private lending. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.